who are refugees and how did they come here? Um, I talked to a few people earlier who were a little bit concerned that maybe this was some sort of a, uh, an attempt to try and you know, start bringing more refugees to northern Idaho. That's not a right. conversation that I've heard from anybody. All right. um, and if that was going to happen, you would hear from it, right. hear about it from your state uh, legislature. That would be a decision that they would make, not something that we would make from an office in Spokane. So um, if that's something that you're concerned about, one way or the other, talk to your state uh, representatives. Um, but I'll tell you that that's, that's not why we're here tonight. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about why refugees, uh, or who are refugees. So um, right now there are 22.5 million refugees in the world. That's the highest that anybody's ever counted since they've been recording figures on refugees, which started right around the end of World War II. Uh, so as far as anybody can tell, there's more refugees right now in the world than there has been at any point um, in the recorded history of keeping track of refugees. So what is a refugee? A refugee is somebody who has had to flee their home country for reasons of persecution. Um, the technical definition that the United Nations uses is that you have to flee based on a well-founded fear of persecution, and that can be based on religion, ethnicity, gender, political opinion, or some other category. So basically what it means is that you've either been persecuted or you have a legitimate reason to think that if you stayed in your country, you would be persecuted. So you're going to hear a couple stories tonight, um, but pretty much everybody we see that comes through our office is people who um, they've had family members who've been beaten or killed for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's religious reasons. Um, sometimes it's political reasons. You know, some dictator comes to power and decides they're going to wipe out everybody who's associated with the other party. We've had a number of people um, who that's been their experience, um, or it may be another reason. So um, it's not easy to be a refugee, actually. There's 66 million displaced people in the world. Who, so two-thirds of those don't even count as refugees because they've either stayed in their own country or they could go back because there's not a legitimate reason to think that they would be persecuted. So um, you have to experience or have a legitimate reason to feel like you can't even return to your home country. So when you hear things like, um, like people in Syria, for example, somebody from northern Syria has fled to southern Syria because their city has been attacked or reduced to rubble, that doesn't count as a refugee because they're still inside the borders of their country. Um, in other cases, people may flee outside of their country, but there's a legitimate reason to think that maybe in a short period of time they could return. They don't count as a refugee. So the way it works is if you do flee your country, and you meet these qualifications, you have to register with the United Nations. And that's a process of interviews and identity checks and biometric data uh, in order to get through their system. The UN says you are a legitimate refugee. They give you a refugee identification number, and they'll refer you into a resettlement program from one of about 10 countries. So the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, England, Sweden, a few other countries receive refugees. Um, and so in the United States case, we get a referral from the United Nations. It goes to our State Department, and then the State Department runs people through these long series of background checks. Um, the, usually it takes at least two years to go through the background check process for a refugee to come to the United States. Um, it's actually the most extensive vetting process of any kind of immigrant. So if you want to get a tourist visa, or come on a student visa, come on a work visa, any of those other visas are easier to get than a refugee visa because uh, the screening is really, really long and intensive. Um, if you want more information on exactly what that is, go to the U.S. State Department's website. It's, uh, the branch is called the Citizenship and Immigration Services, so uscis.gov. Uh, is the website that describes the whole refugee resettlement program. If you go there, you can, they've got some videos and some graphics that show you exactly what that process looks like. Um, the minimum if, is two years just to get through that process, but it's not uncommon for us to have people who, um, it takes them you know, upwards of 10 years to get through the system. So for people, for people who live in refugee camps, the average amount of time they're there is 17 years before they get resettled. So we're not talking about people who, 
it's inconvenient, there's a short conflict in their country, they leave for a few months, they get a ticket to America, and that's it. We're talking about people who live their whole lives in, um, in these camps with no hope of returning. A lot of the kids here in these choirs were born in camps, and that's the only life they ever knew. Um, because there's no legitimate reason for, that they would be able to go back to some of the countries that have these long-standing civil wars uh, that just drag on and on. So that's a little bit of the background of kind of how refugees get here. World Relief is a resettlement agency. So our job is to work with people once they get here. So it's the federal government, the, the, you know, the State Department, Department of Homeland Security, all those guys do all the screening and handle all the other arrangements. But when somebody, um, it's determined that they're going to come to Spokane, which most of the time is because they've got some sort of friend or relative here that they're coming to be connected with. Um, but it could also be, you know, that there's a reason why Spokane might be the, you know, a good place for them to come. So once they end up in Spokane, our job is that we then go and we, we meet them at the airport, and for 90 days, we work to help them help them get settled with the essential things that they would need to start a new life in America. So we help them find an apartment, <clears throat> some sort of sta safe, stable, affordable housing. Um, if they have kids, we help get their kids enrolled in school. Um, most of refugees, more than 50% of refugees around the world are 18 and under, so the majority are kids, which is about what we, we get a pretty similar percentage to our Spokane office, where we get about half of, of the total person count is kids, so we have kids in a lot of different schools. I think actually in Spokane, uh, we have kids in every single one of the elementary, middle schools, and high schools throughout the whole Spokane area. So, um, oh man, you're passing out cookies. Can I get one? Yes. <laughs> okay, maybe make sure everybody gets one first. Absolutely. Um, so, um, that's what we do at, at our office specifically. We have about 37 staff members, full and part-time, and we're divided into four teams. We've got our resettlement team that helps people through those first 90 days. We've got our employment team that is about nine people who work to help refugees find jobs, but also help employers. Um, sometimes employers maybe haven't had employees that speak you know, different languages or English isn't their strength. So if they still are interested in hiring, Refugees, we work with them on some cultural stuff to make it, to help it uh, work out best for everybody. Um, we've got a legal team. We've got an attorney and a couple of other staff who are licensed to practice immigration law. Uh, because when refugees come, they understand that this is a permanent move. So they come on a visa. Um, after they've been here a year, they qualify to become permanent residents or they get what's called a green card. And we help them with that application process. Um, and then after five years of residency in the United States, you can apply to become a citizen. And so we help them with the paperwork for that and also the preparation process of getting ready to do things like pass the civics exam. And I'll guarantee you that pretty much anybody in this room would not pass the civics exam unless you had help. Um, unless, are there any like eighth graders here who just took eighth grade civics? Um, so we help people get prepared for that process. Uh, the fourth team, that we have at World Relief Spokane is what we call our church and community Takes engagement care of the office. Team. So uh, that team helps um, to engage the community. So the, the funding that we get from the government is very small. I don't know if anybody here works with the government, but they tend to not give you lots and lots of money, um, which is fine. Our goal is not to siphon lots of money off the federal government. Um, but what our goal is is to help people come here and integrate into the community. We want people to come here and keep their African culture and share that with us, but we also want to help them become Americans, uh, to become American citizens and to understand the rest of what it means to be an American. Because one of the coolest things about being American is that it means that you're from everywhere, but we have this common identity. So my grandfather uh, was born here in Coeur d'Alene. His parents came from Sweden. So he grew up in Coeur d'Alene in a household that spoke Swedish. Um, and that's part of my story, is being an American that doesn't speak Swedish anymore, but takes some of the heritage that came from uh, that part of the world and brings that to the community here. And that's what we try to do for refugees from Africa or the Middle East or from, um, you know, Southern Europe, Russian-speaking areas, um, and also we get people from Southeast Asia. So 
that's kind of the goal. The reason we have a community engagement team is because our goal is to make sure that it's the community that does the work. So the government has to do the screening process. They want to make sure there's a checklist, and we do that kind of work for them for the first 90 days. But really, our heart is to see folks integrate into the community. And um, we work with a lot of churches, especially. World Relief is a faith-based organization. But we don't exclusively work with churches. We work with um, other kinds of faith groups. And we also work with people who maybe aren't part of any faith or any faith group. Because we want to see that the community come around folks. So my goal, which I would love to see happen, is that every refugee who comes here gets an American friend. Because that's what it takes to thrive in America. I mean, has anybody here ever traveled overseas? Okay, now keep your hand up if you've ever been overseas for more than like two weeks. Now more hands go up. That's amazing. Um, once you, I mean, it's one thing to vacation somewhere, but once you've been somewhere a couple of weeks, you start to realize like, man, there's all these unwritten rules it's hard to figure out. So we want every refugee who comes to be able to become American, to integrate in, and it takes some help doing that. So many people come from places where you go to buy your tomatoes at the grocery store, and you can argue about the price with the guy who sells tomatoes. In America, you don't argue about the price of tomatoes. But when it comes to buying a car, you don't want to just pay whatever the, the lot tells you. You want somebody who can help you learn to negotiate that. And that's the kind of thing where we want uh, refugees who come here to be able to have that experience of, um, you know, an American who can walk them through that process. So there's going to hopefully be some time at the end to um, do some more Q&A. And I had a few folks give me some questions that they wrote down on cards um, at the beginning. Um, so we'll, I'll address some of those questions that were written down. Hopefully, if we have time, I can just take some, you know, Q&A from the audience. But I mostly just want to say thank you for being here. Um, like I said, for, the, for most of the last almost 30 years that World Relief has been in Spokane, nobody even knew it because nobody really cared. Refugees weren't a big deal because everybody assumed that that was the most natural thing that America could do would be to receive refugees. Because I, I can't tell, but unless there's some full-blooded Native Americans in this room, pretty much all of us have some sort of ancestors who were immigrants, and probably many of us have ancestors, or maybe ourselves or our parents, were refugees in, in one way or another. So it seems very natural to who we are as a country. Um, and until just the last few years, it really wasn't a red versus blue issue on the political spectrum. You know, the, um, you know, the different political parties tended to agree on this. Um, and the modern refugee program was started um, you know, under the presidency of Reagan, which most people from both parties would say was a great one of our best leaders. So um, so I just want to say we're here not to push any sort of agenda. Certainly I'm not here to promote anything political. Um, as a faith-based nonprofit, we are nonpartisan. Uh, we work with whoever our elected officials were. A couple of weeks ago we met with our Republican representative to the U.S. House and got a good relationship with her. We've also got good relationships with our two state senators who are on the other side of the aisle. Our goal um, for me personally as a Christian, is to try to say, hey, these are my values as a Christian and as an American, is to care for the people who can come here and make our community better, um, but also to, to sort of regain our status as the leader in uh, global humanitarian uh, concerns, which is what we've been um, up until recently. So um, I believe that's an important part of who we are as a American, and I'd like to see us continue to, um, to live by that standard. So um, with that, I'm sure there's tons of questions. So if you need to write it down to remember what your questions are, I would invite you to do that. But tonight we're going to hear a couple of stories from people who've come through this process as refugees. Um, we're going to hear some more music from some of these kids who are amazing because I, was, I gave a couple of them a ride over today and um, was asking like how many languages she speaks. She speaks four different languages. So I don't know how many of you speak four different languages. I don't. Um, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of smart kids here who bring a lot of potential to our community. So excited to celebrate that tonight. And um, one thing is, I know there was like a protester out there on the street tonight. Maybe some of you saw that. Um, we're fine with people who disagree um, with you know what we do or um, or whatever. 
But our only ask would be to make sure that we can be respectful. I, I will answer any question that is asked respectfully. Um, I'm totally open to field anything. Um, but we would just ask that the same would be shown to those who are sharing their stories and to the kids who are here uh, so that we can have a constructive conversation. So with that, thank you very much. And, um, <laughs> introduce to you guys the choir members. Um, the cool thing about this is that um, these kids are, are very dear to me. These are like my kids. <laughs> and, um, and it's a blessing to see the, the joy that they bring to me and also to the community. And uh, as Mark mentioned, these are you know former refugees that are from various different countries in Africa. And, our vision is to, to bring unity and to bring that diversity and cultivate culture and, um, and just bring peace within each other. And, uh, and we just hope that um, whatever you hear or experience here, you know that you can also go and educate those who are around you. And uh, we welcome you to partner with, with us. And um, so I just want to take this opportunity um, to introduce you guys to the choir members. I'll, I'll let them do the honors and say their names and where they're from. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Shadrach, and I'm 10 years old, and I'm from Kong. I'm from Uganda. Hi. Hello. My name is Didier, and I'm 11 years old. And I am from Togo. Hello, my name is Lorraine. I'm from Congo. Hello, my name is Divine. I'm nine years old and I am from Uganda. years and uh, honestly um, I'm very privileged to be in America and I thank people like you who have opened their hearts and um, just given me this opportunity to be here. Um, I have came from a lot of uh, places where there's just lots of issues and um, for many years the country that I lived in didn't uh, deem me as a human being and forced me out due to my, my beliefs and uh, of who I was, but today I'm very thankful and honored that you, Americans, have opened your heart and opened your arms to welcome me. So I am so thankful, and I just want to say, you know, from my refugee family to yours, 
very, very thankful. God bless you. Uh, we're going to sing one song. Um, and this song is uh, says we are no longer slaves to fear. Um, you know, I, I believe there's two two types of lies that our culture has bestowed upon us. Is that one, if we love someone, we have to do everything and agree with everything they say. And then two is that if we disagree with somebody, it means that we hate them or we fear them. But that is a lie. You know, and so I just want to encourage you today is that uh, we are all together. We're all the same. And we all matter. So thank you, and uh, we hope you enjoy this song.
Some of the choir members helped me bring stuff in from the car, and I asked them if they were ready to sing, and they said, we're ready to bless lives. I think they've done that. Um, we are going to have two speakers before we hear from the choir again. Our first one will be Pingala Dital. Pingala is, was born in Bhutan. She was a refugee in a refugee camp for 18 years. She came to Spokane in February of 2008. She loves that Spokane is not crowded and that there's no traffic. Pingala has, <laughs> Pingala has two kids. One is working and one is attending college. Pingala Dital. by my relatives, my mom's parents and uncles and aunts. And we knew all the people in the village. My grandfather knew people from the east to west in the southern belt of the country. That's how connected we were. Um, one, like, um, after some time, I don't know, it's, it's a politics. So the government adopted a policy called One Nation, One People Policy. Um, um, later, we knew it was kind of a conspiracy um, to evict um, one-sixth of, of its population So from our ethnic group. So Bhutan has three main ethnic groups, the ruling community, so northerners, um, they call Nalong, and then easterners, Sarsos, and then we were called um, Lot Sampas, people from the south, um, the um, Nepali is speaking. So our ancestors were taken from Nepal um, in 16th century as an entrepreneurs to teach the Bhutanese how to cultivate land. And these people were settled in the southern part of the country, which was malaria infested area. Um, so our people were very hardworking um, and they progressed um, in times. So the, the, the ruling community um, had the fear, like the royal actually, uh, maybe they will take over the country and then by um, when they were doing census they did only on our population and they found out we made the 45% um, of the country's population so a country has 600,000 people um, so they I think it was kind of a conspiracy to balance the demographic demographic of the country um, so we were evicted um, so my um, when when our people so this is the reason uh, protested the policy, um, so one nation, one people policy means we have to wear their um, attire, which is their outfit, which was very different than ours, and we were um, also told to uh, make our hair short, which is not our culture. That's very hard for, especially the older generation. Um, I was okay. I was 16 years old, um, so everything was imposed. So when things are imposed. Um, that's hard, I guess, and you um, living in America, <laughs> it's easy to understand um, what's that. When it was protested peacefully, they cracked down upon us, um, arresting all the men, torturing and raping the women, um, and obviously being a 16-year-old, um, that's the only thing we could do, run as fast as, as you can um, to escape all these um, atrocities. So we came to India, and... Uh, 
waited there to go back home someday, like any time. We didn't know how long it would take. But nine months passed, no, there wasn't a chance. Rather, the Indian uh, forces drove us to Nepal and left us there. Um, and there was no, um, no signs to leave a life because there wasn't UN or anything. The country had to invite UN. Since we were Nepali speaking, I think India also thought, okay, they should go back to Nepal. But it was like, after so many generations, we knew nothing. Um, I had never been to Nepal um, in my life. So UNHCR was invited, we were screened, and then kept in a refugee camp for um, 18 years. So after getting into the refugee camp after four years, I got married, I had children there. My grandmother died in the camp, and many, many children were dying every day. There was a, there was a day, there was a huge thunderstorm in the camp. So whenever there was a um, thunderstorm, we had to hang on our roof um, to keep the plastic roof um, on our head. <laughs> so, and then in the morning, we found out a man died. And I thought like, really, if we were in our home, he wouldn't have been dead like this in, a, in, the, in the jungle. We were cornered, like kept in like this unwanted place. The refugees are rejected people, like we are a piece of trash, like no one would even, um, so our human values were devalued to, to the lowest. The locals wouldn't want to talk to us, like although we speak the same language, um, we share same culture, but if we are refugees, which means we are nothing. Like, um, so, so leaving that kind of, um, such an unwanted life was, um, was hard, but there was only hope that we lived with was to go back home. So there is no place on the earth like that's as close, um, as beautiful um, as is. Like that is the only place, like we wanted to go back home. So 18 years, the government of Nepal and Bhutan had bilateral talk, they wanted to solve the problem. Um, so we wanted to go back home with dignity and honor, <laughs> but that day never came. 18 years passed and I realized one day, um, my son came, was uh, started to go to school and he comes back from school with a drag um that's how they go and they sit on the dirt floor and he and he came back and he threw his bag and then he vanished in the camp it's easy to disappear and i started thinking that made me think um this is not going right there the people are living in the camp they, they are becoming nothing. Back in the country, we had a dream. We wanted to become something and we would achieve what we wanted. We had goals. Although it's not a big goal, but you have a dream. You, so, but in the camp, like generations ha have passed. No one has become a doctor. No one has become an engineer. No, like it's not going right. And the school, the education quality I got was better than my children. So in gen, in the, in a generation, so a new generation has to do better. So as a mother, oh, I had a dream. So no one can stop people from dreaming, like no matter where you live, in even in a refugee camp, I, I had a dream when I had my children. Then I thought, okay, I gave them birth in this, under this plastic roof with so much pain. I think it's my responsibility to give them a future too. And later, um, we used to have lots of visitors from, international community. So there were um, the state, um, the Secretary of State, or refugee population, whatever, it's very long, from the United States, also went to visit our camp. And then we learned. Until then, I was so quiet. And you know, um, I, I was uh, brought up in a patriarchal society. So where women are um, told that, oh, women does small work, like women do small work, um, men do big work. So the women's um, small work is to give birth to children, raise them, feed them, make the house, um, like do laundry, like um, feed everybody on time, wash dishes, clothes, everything, whatever the house has to, so run the house, do groceries. That's women, like women's small um, task that it, no one counts. Like if they ask, what, do you, what does your wife do? Oh, she does nothing. So she stays home and does all, all these things. And what does men do? Sometimes in, in our culture, they can also inherit lots of wealth from there. If they're a wealthy father, mother, so it's like they pass on to generations. Some of them, they don't even have to work. Um, 
So these men can just talk what they talk about politics. They talk about like America, that, that's big work. Like if they talk about other places and politics, which um, doesn't, so that kind of society I was born. I was not allowed to speak about big things. Those are big things. If I talk about what's going on about our movement, that would be big talk, that's not me. Um, but then I decided, okay, um, my husband was um, a different man, so he supported me. So he said, okay, the, we, because it's an ego for a man to say, oh, now we cannot go back to our country, we can go anywhere. Um, so uh, we had to speak because it was very um, inferior thing to say, we are tired, we cannot leave here, we, we want to go anywhere. But that was a real thing for me, that I really wanted to give future to my children, so I told them, um, I asked my leader, when are you taking back us, like, um, us home? Because when I left my country, it was one week, and then six months, and then 14, 15 years have passed. There is no way to go back. And he didn't have the answer. So, and I met um, many of the stakeholders. They didn't have the answer. So, and I um, found out that on UN mandate, um, the refugees could be solved in three different ways either to go back home, which is repatriation, or um, um, assimilate in the host country, which is Nepal. Nepal um, itself um, is a struggling, um, so there is no way uh, 150,000 people could be resettled in Nepal. So the other one is third country resettlement, which is to go anywhere in the, um, in the earth, whoever is willing to take them. And another fact we learned was, while we were residing in the refugee camp, U.S. was um, supporting, so 50% of the aids were coming from, the, from America. So either way, Americans were supporting us, either in the refugee camp or while we are here. <laughs> so, and I thought, like, why, why not I would go anywhere so at least my children would become productive? Although my life was destroyed, I feel like I, I was worthless. Um, I couldn't do anything. So we, the prime time of our life was spent in the refugee camp doing nothing. So that's how I felt. And I started talking, and which became um, a little bit um, a challenge. It was uh, very conflicting to some of our leaders. And I also realized some of the facts that we were kind of political scapegoat. If we don't know anything, we were not aware of any politics or um, so anyway, long story short, um, so it was February two, um, 2008, we got a plane ticket and then uh, we were told um, that we were going to America and I saw Washington and I thought like I knew a few people in Washington and so I thought okay, um, at least we know them. So we were the first uh, family, so from the whole refugee camp, uh, my family was the first case to depart. And we came to New York and then uh, from there to Chicago, Chicago to um, Washington. And my husband was like, why it's taking so long? My friend said um, they drove from Washington to New York. Um, it wasn't that long. And he like, uh, maybe they're taking long route, who knows? Um, so, and it was midnight, we were flying, about to land um, in Spokane and I saw like um, all the lights and I told my kids, um, hey, look down, there's one of the lights is our ha home. So we, we landed and there was world relief um, to receive us at the airport. And that was like the moment, like um, it's, um, it's a melting moment. Like I was so thrilled like to see these strangers um, coming to us um, to receive us. And it's just, uh, um, I was so thankful that um, what, um, what is this? Like we were kind of rejected by the the place we were born, everybody pushed us away, nobody wanted, and then this great nation, like these people, they don't have to worry, like they don't have to welcome refugees, you can live your life, you don't have to even cross the border, you have so much things to do, it's, you are privileged, you have everything, but still you are so kind, like um, you are there at midnight, and so that means a lot to me, like the more I live, I mean living here more, longer, the more, I appreciate that effort to come, go to the airport at midnight it means a lot. Like with um, with this busy life, all um, um, leaving all things behind and family at home. So, and I um, in on day three, 
I came to um, World Relief Office for a cultural orientation, and I asked, where is White House? And they showed me this big map. And then I thought, okay, that's not the Washington. <laughs> I went to the, <laughs> the other Washington, and I, I was a little bit um, disappointed like, to um, see that uh, being so far away from my world and like being close to Pacific Ocean, like, oh my gosh, this, this is really far away. Um, but then um, as I started to leave, I think that was the right place. I was placed in a right place. My kids um, started to go to school. They were so happy, like they were so excited that there will be no uniform. So they got to go to school. Um, I became a citizen in 2013. My son graduated last year. Um, so as a civil engineer and he's working. Um, so it's just, uh, and my daughter is going to college. That's what I came for. Um, that, that was my dream for my children. Um, and I am I'm so thankful for for this great nation being so caring for um, people outside and and we can really make difference if if one person is willing like we don't have to do a lot like if one person can reach out to a vulnerable um, it gives so much hope it's I think that's what we need and I think we can change the world um, by loving each other I think that's what we could um, give. And even the guy who is outside, I feel like hopeful that maybe if these kind of people could get together and negotiate with my country, I would like to go back to my country. Um, and if if I can reach out to him, maybe he would talk to talk to my country. I would go back um, because um, there is no place that I would feel comfortable than being in in my own country. That um, so I I. I wish one day we could go back to my country, at least to visit the country. I still think um, I'm anti-national. Although I was 16 years, I didn't have much role, but um, I'm waiting for, still I'm waiting for that day. 20 years, 28 years have passed, um, but I haven't had that day yet. So um, I don't know, maybe someday I will. We're, we're still hopeful. Thank you so much for listening. But I wanted to just take an opportunity to explain another piece of the story. Um, hearing refugees' stories, like Pingala's story, is good because it helps us understand uh, that we're not talking about just big numbers, but individuals. Um, but I also wanted to explain that in addition to sort of the compassionate reasons why, um, why I'm involved in this and why a lot of other people are, that there's a lot of good statistical and, um, you know, practical reasons why our country has been involved in refugee resettlement um, and why it's still a good idea from sort of an economic perspective. So um, let me give you a little bit of statistics and information related to that. Um, I think that one of the things that I hear a lot from different people um, who are hesitant or unsure about refugee resettlement is that they're worried about the economics of it. They say things like, um, how can our government spend more money on these people, especially when we see a lot of needs already in our community? Um, why don't we have more social money for the people who are born here who are struggling, um, rather than bringing more people from overseas to help them? Another thing is I hear people saying, um, these folks come, and yeah, maybe they're really hard workers, um, but is it fair that people who are born here should have to compete with people who come from overseas who you know, are willing to work for any amount of money, uh, doesn't that suppress wages and doesn't that um, cause there to be a shortage of employment? So um, the most recent statistics that I can give you uh, would be, one piece would be a, uh, a study commissioned by President Trump this last year where it studied the impact of refugees um, from 2005 to 2015 um, and the study found that actually the, the refugee population during that 10 year window um, actually added $63 billion to the federal tax base beyond what their expenses were. So it's actually a revenue generating um, uh, thing for the federal government. That didn't, that, that's not something that we hear a lot from them these days, but the statistics from their own research suggest that this is a good economic value for the social services system. Um, uh, there's also a couple of studies that have looked at particular communities and found that um, refugee communities are lower crime 
than many of the existing populations. So in, in like cities where refugees have moved in concentrated numbers to certain neighborhoods, the police have documented that the crime rate in those neighborhoods goes down. Um, from an economic like jobs standpoint, um, refugees actually create more jobs and they tend to fill, at least in the first few years, they fill a, a needed gap in the labor market. So like in Spokane, um, we work with about 100 employers, many of whom come back to us repeatedly because they say that they can't find American-born people who will take the kind of jobs they have. So for example, we, we have a lot of people who take jobs working in hotels, um, you know, doing housekeeping or working you know, swing shifts and things like that, that people who are born here don't want those kinds of jobs. Uh, but it's good for our whole economy if there are people to fill those jobs. Refugees typically um, are very eager to take and fill those jobs. Um, another thing uh, relates to sort of the social services money. Some people say things like, hey, our systems are insufficient for like taking care of our veterans, for example. We all know that there's issues with the Veterans Administration, with veterans who are homeless. We see them next to the freeway all the time with the signs. So why would we give money to refugees if there's veterans who apparently aren't getting the help that they need? Um, we're in conversation and partnership with a lot of different social service agencies in Spokane, uh, part of this big group called the Homeless Coalition that works on homelessness, including veterans. Um, and the way the funding works is actually different. So the funding for the resettlement program comes through um, one of two offices, either the Office of Refugee Resettlement or the Office of, of Populations, Refugees and Migration, which is both through the State Department. The other kinds of funding either come through the VA administration um, or through whatever the federal social services department is. So they're actually very different pots of money. It's not like every dollar to a refugee is taken from somebody else. It's actually different. Um, part of the reason that the US government invests in this program, not just economically because it helps our economy, um, but it's a really important piece of our foreign policy overseas. So right now, the country of Jordan, which is way smaller than the U.S., it's a way smaller economy, um, has well over a million Syrian refugees living inside of their borders. So it's really a strain on their economy, on everything, to have a million people living in a state that's like the size of North Idaho um, who have fled this war. So part of what the U.S. does to try and encourage Jordan to keep these people so they don't all go back and either get killed in Syria or radicalized because they have no hope is the US government says, hey, will you hang on to that million Syrians? If you do, we'll take 10,000 to our country where we can easily absorb them into our economy um, and into our social structures. If we do our slice of the pie, we're encouraging you to take care of these other people so that we don't create a worse mess in the Middle East. That's part of the rationale for why the US has traditionally um, been strategic in taking refugees. Last piece I'll share, and there may be more questions, we can address this later, um, is specifically to each community. So I had a question earlier from somebody who said, um, you know, you guys aren't thinking of bringing refugees to, or reselling them here to North Idaho, right? Because we have a lot of um, economic challenges and our schools couldn't absorb it. We, you know, all these things that might be a strain on our uh, different budget issues from the state social services side. Um, the way the program is set up nationally is that each state has an office of refugee resettlement. So like in Washington, we have one person who's called the state refugee coordinator. And they work uh, in the governor's office to do an assessment on every community that, that, that resettles refugees. And they look at um, housing, the economy, jobs, the public schools, the social services system, and they do an assessment and say, how many refugees can this community realistically um, integrate into the community every year. So in Spokane, the number that I got when I talked to the um, our state coordinator, I talked with her monthly. Um, last time I asked her what number we, you know, she thinks we could absorb, she said about 700 a year. Um, we've never resettled more than 600 in a year, and this year we're looking at probably less than 200. So it's not at all a, a capacity issue um, from that standpoint, and. Another thing people don't understand, and then I'll invite somebody else up to share here their story a little bit, is that there's a larger conversation about immigration in the United States. And a lot of communities talk about um, all, how all the jobs are getting swallowed up by immigrants. Um, 
I would be the first to say that we have a broken immigration system in our country, and we would very much like to see it fixed. A lot of the people who come here without papers, um, you know, cross the border without being inspected or whatever, um, those, that's something that our government does not control very well. Um, and there's a lot of other information out there that we could talk about in a different venue about sort of the economics and the politics of that issue. Um, but that's actually a different issue than refugees. So we're here to share about refugees. I'd be happy to talk about other kinds of immigration later and what a, a more whole immigration system might look like. Um, but some of the arguments get blended. Hey, you know, we don't know who these people are. They're not vetted. They come and take jobs they don't have. That's not actually a conversation about refugees. Because in Europe, refugees flood in without being, you know, uh, nobody really regulates that because they can't, because the refugees all come from countries that are just a boat ride away. But in our country, you can't get here unless you go through this very clear process. So I just wanted to separate those things, provide a little bit more information. Again, we can take more questions later. Um, but I want to let you hear from another person. What? Oh, well, then let's let Ashley introduce him. That'd be better than me. You've heard me talk too much. Thank you, guys. So our next speaker is Jackson Leno. Jackson is a former refugee from South Sudan. He came to the United States when he was 12 with his aunt and uncle. The unfamiliar culture made it very difficult to connect with others in his community. So he encouraged other refugees to gather each week and practice English and learn songs. Jackson is now with World Relief Spokane and is the director and power behind the Nima Youth Choir. Nima means grace in Swahili, and this choir is made up entirely of refugee children from a wide variety of African countries. The Nima Choir provides our neighbors who are struggling to find a place within the community to remember their roots and to make peace with their past and find hope in a foreign land. Jackson. Hello, everybody. Hello. I actually want to invite the kids to come up um, while I share my story. So go ahead and come up, guys. Um, most important thing is that we are all human beings. Right? Yes. We all bleed red? Yes. Right? And we all want the same thing. What do we want? We want love from one another. Right? Yes. Um, these kids here are just like your kids. And they have seen a lot of things. They've gone through so much in life. But yet, they have that hope and they're able to give back to the community through their songs and dance. Myself, I came to the United States about 17 years ago. And the life that I had lived in the past is not something that I desire to remember. Um, both of my parents were, were killed when I was two years old. And I ended up in an orphanage and uh, found myself brainwashed, not even knowing who I was. I was deemed as a non-human being, and I was a slave to rebels, to groups of people that did things that were just horrible. Until that day when I was able to connect with my family, and something was so amazing, you know. Um, to be in a refugee camp, I was there for four years. Uh, the life that I've seen, people dying, people suffering, it was difficult. And one of the happiest moments that I've experienced was when I saw our names was on a list to come to this place called America. It was, I was like, what is this America place? You know? Um, and I remember we were loaded into a truck and driving to the airport, and I looked behind me and I just see a group of running, and I see moms and dads and kids, they're just falling on the ground. There's bullets firing through and you just see people's heads coming off. That was my life for many years. I hated airplanes, I didn't want to get on one, because what I saw was that they were, 
they, they did harm to villages. They did harm to people. I remember flying over, and I want to share with you a small, funny story. So, you know, as a refugee kid, you are, you're concerned about technology and things like that. And so I remember we were in the air, airplane, and we were just going, and I nudged my uncle, hey, I want to go to the bathroom. And uh, he's like, okay. He's had one of the flight attendants escort me down to the bathroom. And literally, I got done with all my, you know, doing my things, pants down. And I see this button there, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to push that button. <laughs> I, ran out of the, I ran out of the bathroom butt naked. It was crazy. It was like, oh my gosh. You know, thank God there was no emergency landing. But the first place, you know, I was looking, I was looking out the window and I see this, all these lights that was just bright. And, you know, we landed and the smell of it was just really, it was different. People were smiling. People were walking around hand in hand. It was cold. And you know, actually, this jacket, guys, this jacket is something that I wear with. Mark knows, and whoever works with me knows. I wear this jacket with me 24-7. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's like, it's, it's just something that I'm still used to. You know, I'm 17 years and I still haven't gotten used to the weather. But, you know, New York is where the first soil we landed in. It was just beautiful. Um, from there, we were in Boise, Idaho. That was where uh, the uh, settlement agency World Relief welcomed us. And there was tons of people in the airport, and it was beautiful. Just the, the sense of unity and community and love that you American people came to the airport and showed me. Man, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be who I am today. You know, it was grandparents, moms, kids, had banners and signs. That love that was shown to me, was beautiful, and I can't remember, I cannot forget that, you know? Um, so, what am I saying here, guys? Um, there are countless of refugees that are in their, you know, in other places in the world that are facing persecution, that are needing hope, that are clinging onto something and hoping someone like you open their doors and their hearts to welcome them. You know, um, something that I remember, I always think, how would it feel to have my mom and dad with me? It's painful a lot of times when I see young boys and girls with their moms walking down the streets and things like that. And for me, I didn't get that opportunity. But once I came to America, there were moms and dads and took me in and loved on me. I got to go to school. You know, when I came here, I didn't speak any English. Are you surprised? <laughs> I didn't speak any English. Now I'm just like, <laughs> I'm not able to keep quiet because I'm so blessed by your support, by your love, by your kindness, by, your, by opening your hearts and welcoming me into your, your home. You know, these kids, I'm so blessed to have them, you know. Our duty in the community is simple, is to love our community, to share the blessings that they have bestowed upon us. Um, we, we go out to the community, we sing, and we share our stories in churches and um, events like this. And we, we want you to guys to partner with us. We want you guys to, to also be out there and encourage those who are around us, who might have different thoughts, you know? Um, and and let's, let's come together. That's the, only, that's the only way that we can make life good is that when we come together and love on one another. Can you imagine that? Doesn't matter where, what skin you are, doesn't matter what, what you believe, if we just come and put our difference aside and say, hey brother, hey sister, I love you for who you are. Not because you look this way, not because you think this way, not because of who you are, because you're a human being, and because you matter. So today we wanna sing a song that is called, I Am Not Forgotten. And this song requires you guys to stand up and also sing with us, okay? Now, I know some people say Americans have two left feet. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. But this song is called, I Am Not Forgotten. And we want to show you, we want to encourage you and let you know that you 
are not forgotten, that you are important, you know, and we just want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to be with you today. Um, we are open to answering any questions. If you have, um, if you want to know more about what we do as far as World Belief and what I do, um, go on our website, worldbeliefspokane.com, and also about the kids. Nema choir. Nema means grace in Swahili, and we believe that God's grace has been bestowed upon us, and we want to give that to you as well. So, we appreciate you guys, really, for this time. Um, please stand with us. There's this just for minutes, uh, we're waiting for. Technology is crazy sometimes, you know? I love it and I hate it at the same time. But uh, um, we're. So just give us a few seconds here. Um, maybe if Mark could come here and if anybody has any, maybe one or two questions. Um, Sir, I'd like to ask you what religion were, was the people who killed your parents? Um, that I, I don't know. Um, I just know, I, I, I wouldn't say it's religion. Um, I would just say it's a group of rebels who um, saw that we as people weren't part of the community and didn't want us around. Um, but uh, I can, all, all I can say is that I'm just so thankful for the opportunity that I, I've been given to come here. And really, I'm thankful for you. You know, I'm thankful that you have given me this chance to be here. Thank you. We support missionaries to South Sudan regularly, but the South Sudanese, the SPLC, is fighting Muslims. It's Islam. That's who's killing your people in South Sudan is Muslims. I wouldn't put it really that way. Um, I think it's humans killing humans. Oh, humans, right. Honestly, that's, uh, that's, that's the thing. Um, but... Uh, we just want to encourage you, and we, we just want to thank you for this time. So we'll go ahead and sing, and uh, go from there. Thank you so much. So this song says, I am not forgotten, because God knows you. He knows you by name. He knows you before you were even born. And that you matter.
for asking questions here. You know, they said that we were going to ask questions and there's not been a question one asked. So... So we're going to do a little following around and see if we can get a couple questions asked around here. Excuse me. I do have a question. I 
I was un under the understanding people are going to be allowed to ask questions here tonight. And this is just now all being ended. So wh where is these questions being asked at? I would say go find them. We're not really sure. Yeah. I would say go find someone that was talking like that park guy. Yep. Right. I don't see him. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a look over here to see if I can find the guy, the main speaker. Where the main speaker went? No, sir, I don't. You were you leaving before the question and answer period? Well, that's the whole thing. We're supposed to be able to ask questions, and and you left. into this country. Um, a 500 million? A billion? Yeah, I'm upset because my children have a future and you're preventing that. So you can virtue signal it. So you can virtue. Do you feel better? If you want to help people in Africa, why don't you go to Africa and help them? Why don't you go there? Why do you put, place the burden on us? But you know what? Why do you place the burden on us? You are not, I've been to Africa, you are not welcome there. Yeah. yeah. You know, that you know what? Circumcision so I live in Idaho because I'm a refugee from New York City. I was born in New York City in 1964, the year before the Hart Cellar Act. Since that time, 50 million immigrants have come here, and I can't go back. I'm gonna try to get over here and get a better picture. Yeah, just because I'm white. Cool. This isn't our town. This isn't our public library. We have an opportunity to. Were you here last night? Who are you? Why are we talking to you? I, really? I know, yeah, I'm really, 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 really. So why really. are why are you coming so, down? So are, are, are you are you part of the organization? I'm, I'm are you part of are you part of the organization? Well, that's fine. That's fine. Well, they they had us come here for a question and answer, and we didn't go. All I wanted was a simple question. Point very well made. We're all wanting answers. You know. I thank mean, you for how many? You know. Thank you for speaking you, you up. Know, it's called emotional blackmail. That's what it is. You are emotionally blackmailing us because if we say no, then we're evil. Then we're just pure evil. For all of you that support it, why don't you bring them into your own homes? Feed them, each and every one of them. But no, you want to place the burden on the rest of us. No, I'm not actually, but you know what? I, I do have some sort of moral obligation to the people that I am the community. I mean, enough's enough. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so but this is so unfair to have these children come up here. Do you think I don't care about kids? No, they want to lay all of Say hi, Trev. Hi. You know, and I have a Japanese wife, by the way, and I lived in Japan for three years, and it is and it is the pinnacle of arrogance for me to expect them to change their culture, their values from me. Okay, when I lived there for three years, I did everything that Japanese people did. You know, what's going to happen is it's going to get uglier. It's going to get uglier. And then we're not going to be so nice anymore. You guys had me up until about two years ago. I was the most bleeding heart liberal, okay? And it's done. No, no, everyone else can hear me because I don't have a microphone. But you lost me now. Enough's enough.
I'm not going to be guilty. I'm not going to be guilty anymore. Just out news. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go question the uh, gentleman that was the main speaker. Hi, sir. I'm here on behalf of Redoubt What's News, John Alexander. Hi, John. I'm Thanks also the captain of the U.S. militia as well. Okay. I would like to ask a couple questions. You um, know, I, I know they said. Could, could, how about this? Could we set up a time to have another okay. conversation? Okay. My my question is tonight. Sure. We've got all these people here in the room. Yep. Correct. Sure. Okay. One of the speeches that you gave here tonight is that the. At, when you're done speaking, you're going to allow people to speak to you. And I have for the last and, 20 minutes I've been answering Okay. Yeah. So, so, so currently, this is half of the problem over here is all these guys were wanting to hear you speak, okay. right, answer questions. And you're off over here where there's just a couple people. Well, a lot you know, of your guys in the resist t-shirts were the folks I was over here talking to. Okay. So that's what I was talking. If you want, I'd be happy to come and have another conversation with your whole militia group. Okay. Here's my card. Let me know, and we'll. I'd be All glad right. to come over and have a conversation. And, yeah, and I would like, yeah, I'd definitely like to set up an interview with you. That'd be great. And we can go from there. And I appreciate you guys coming out. It's really important to understand both sides of everything. You know, a lot of what we get from the media, both sides of right. it is pretty slanted. Okay. And I appreciate you guys coming out to, you know, well, really get One of the questions story. I'd like to ask here myself tonight. Before you leave, okay. One of the things you're. I can do one question okay. and then I think. I one, get the kids okay. Out. One of the things you brought up. This is going to be good for our economy here, correct? Okay. I know. I know how things work. First of all, you're saying it's good for the motels and, and the industries and all this. Ninety percent of the motels, they're India owned, correct? Ninety percent in America. Anybody that doesn't know I've that. I've never heard that. Yep. Yeah. Google. And I do know that a lot of the owners of the hotels in Spokane are not okay. Indian. Like a lot of them are locally owned, especially our, our Most biggest. of your most Tel 6s, Super 8s, those are all Patel owned. If you go, you can Google None it. None of them in Coeur d'Alene are. So, and I'm he not going to speak so much for here. So he, he actually knows all but, stuff, but I've been so. nationwide, and I can tell you right now. Well, I really only know the main the stuff about kind of our, in just a few our area, we need especially the Spokane area. Okay. So, all right. What what was your full name again? Uh, Mark Finney. Mark Finney. We're okay. overleaf Spokane. All right, Mark. I'd definitely like to set up an interview with you, and we can go from there. Hey, your name one more time. Yeah, John Alexander. John, appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Yeah, have a good night. God bless. So most of these guys didn't really get a talk over here at all, yeah. and you notice how they kind of cut the time frame. Yeah, well, see, did you record that, the question and answer session that never got done? Yeah. This is this is the question and answer. What was it again? I'm sorry. Answer and answer session that never got, they skipped over. Yep. So these are all the questions that they totally skipped over tonight. Well, no, that's not the question. Right there. They never did that part. They skipped that whole part. You want to read that up? It says, questions and answers session. They never did it. They skipped over it. Thank you very much. Hey, Freeman. 
Do you guys feel tonight all of you guys got your questions answered? Not at all. Not at all. Not even one. No, they okay. their way you're out you're on time. live recording with Readout they News. They talked their way out at time and fed us a bunch of bulls. Yes. Uh, uh, well, made he, it look all warm and fuzzy with two kids up on stage. Just, he so just we wouldn't get a chance to get our voices heard. Yeah. Now they're picking us up. Yes, ma'am. So. Yeah, he spent almost 20 minutes. Said he spent 20 minutes with you guys going the length. And then this lady over here with the organization calls this, this lady right here a new generation of racists. Right. It's time to go. We're all closing up. All right. We need to leave. Sorry. So it looks like we're being thrown out of the library. So we'll go out here and see if we have any protesters tonight. You guys see my wife outside? So I've been kind of asking everybody, this is on Readout News. Hey, Sherry, how's it going? Do you feel they answered all your questions here tonight? No. Absolutely not. So, okay, thank you very much. The main speaker said he spent. We're more concerned about one of the supporters of the refugees attacked one of our members' children walking out with this sign pointed at the child and said, Oh, look at the next little generation of racists. Uh, to her credit, she did hey, just come out and apologize. Hey, I've got a couple of books. Would you be interested in a book? In any case. It's written by our director. It gives all the details and facts and figures and all that stuff. Okay. Yep. That's okay. Enjoy it. Pass it around. Here, if you want one too, I'll get a couple of extras. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys for being here. You bet. Idaho. Absolutely. Thank you for protecting America. Oh. Or at least taking a stand. You don't mind being on readout news? So. Uh, Sherry, you were very missed. I was looking for you tonight. <laughs> um, oh. so. Yeah. Uh, and Candy, I hope you get better. She couldn't be here with us tonight. Looks like they're all telling you hello. <laughs> oh, good. I love you, girls. <laughs> Freeman. Appreciate you guys coming out too. And Jim, do you feel like you've gotten all your questions here answered tonight? Nope. Thank you. Not a damn one of them. I'm sorry, what's that? Not a damn one of them. <laughs> it's pretty good choir music anyways. <laughs> that was meant to be sarcastic. Because <laughs> that's about all they had. It's like Joanne said Sure, and all the young kids make yep. me feel bad. 
I need your sleep bag or a, or a sock. <laughs> Hey brother, yeah. appreciate you coming out. Yeah, have a good night. You bet. <laughs> Gentlemen, you don't mind me filming a little with Reed Out Dues? Appreciate you guys coming out yeah. tonight. Yeah, thank you. Same. Yeah, appreciate you coming out. Too. Thanks, thanks, thanks yeah, for Reed Out News for all the good work hey, you're you doing. Bet. You good bet, buddy. Thanks for Reed Out News for all the good work you're doing. Good show. <laughs> Well, I don't see a bunch of riders. Yes, we are. Cool. I'll tell you something real quick. All right. Downstairs, and one of the people at the event, I don't know if she was with the, the group or not, she, I didn't actually hear it, but someone else goes, she just calls your kid a racist. She said, my my little kid is the next generation of racists. So is these little kids right here yeah, this right are here. the next He's generation? A racist. So I just walked up to her and I said, you know what, I said, this is shame on you, this is ridiculous. You're really calling me a racist because I'm raising him. And you just stand up to him and these people will feel bad about what they say. They're in there preaching that we're humans and we bleed the same red blood, but we're the racist. Yep. I didn't call anybody names here. I came and just listened, politely watched. They said we were going to have a question and answer session and we did it. Maybe it's appropriate because there were children in there. I understand that, but you just you call them out yep. and you say, "Hey, why are you saying we're racist? Like, why do you go to that?" And then she came and she apologized to me. I said I accept her apology 100%. And then we we kind of came together a little bit, you know. So Absolutely. out of their mind, but at least you know you don't get physical or you don't get crazy. You just try and talk to them. It takes a while to break through that emotional barrier with these people, but once you break through, then you have a chance. So I just wanted to yep. let everybody, whoever's watching, know that. Well, one of the things, I, one yeah, of the things called. tonight, you know, we've got the U.S. militia here. We've got the three percenters here, yeah. and we we have not had a we have not had any kind of hostility at all here tonight. And now, now we have the police here. <laughs> well, you guys have a good night. Absolutely. What's yep. I see six police cars. That's it. So, but, but here, let me hold that. But other than that, we've had a pretty good meeting here tonight, and everything, every, everything seemed to be pretty peaceful for everybody. And I wonder what this is all about. I don't know. I haven't heard of any trouble. So, here, you want to... I, I was taking it. Yeah, you want to take this to, to my car, I'll please? And here. I'm, I've got a... I don't know what up. Yep. <laughs> so... How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. But other than that, you know, this is a pretty peaceful event for everybody down here. I don't see any rioting or anything else. I don't either. I don't know what the heck's going on So, here. not to be nosy, is there something going on down here tonight? Yeah, people are calling. I guess people are calling. You okay. guys know more than me. Yeah. Well, this was a very peaceful event tonight. Everybody listen. What part? What's that? What part is peaceful? Well, we all listen. That's what it's all about. And that's what this whole event was for. We all come out to find out what this is all about here in Idaho. Yeah. And we found out. So. Yeah, we don't know anything over. about what's going on out back. We just walked up the stairs. Something happened out back? I think that's where all the trucks are locked. If we're going around the corner here, they're kind of walking back. I think that's where all the kids are at down here. Did you over? Yes, sir. Hey, we, just to, we don't want anyone to have problems. That's it. Yep. Well, appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys coming out. What's your name? My name. Yep. Sergeant Cantrell. All right, John Alexander. Nice to meet you. Appreciate you coming out. How's it going? My name is Brenda. All right. Nice to meet you. All right. 
So we got to keep good relation with our local law enforcement. <laughs> You guys know what all the police are here for? Probably all of us. They like us, I guess. They just want to hold hands. <laughs> Good answer. Well, gentlemen, looks like the show's about over. Yeah. My favorite part was the question and answer. I'm sorry, what was that? My favorite part was the question and answer. Part. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, Sherry, we're going to end this live interview. So it was good having everybody aboard tonight. Sorry for the delay in the filming earlier, but technical difficulties. And you all have a wonderful night.